Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to another installment of the Human Rights in Myanmar webinar series. Um, today's topic is humanitarian considerations in Myanmar. This series is being organized by the Institute for the Study of Human Rights at Columbia University. My name is Christina Eberbach and I'm the deputy director there. Today, we are very excited to welcome David Matheson, who is an independent analyst with over 20 years of experience in Myanmar, is both an independent consultant as well as with many well-established international human rights organizations. He has also contributed to our University Human Rights Education in Myanmar project over the years as a guest educator and mentor to our faculty. Um, before I turn it over to Dave, I'd also like to briefly introduce my colleague, Ben Fleming, who is the co-lead um, with me on our Myanmar project and will be co-moderating this event today. Um, there are a couple of prepared remarks um, that we'll begin with, but then we are really hoping to establish um, a nice discussion. So if you have questions or comments, please add them um, using the Q&A function and we'll go ahead and pass those along. And thank you again for joining. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dave. Thank you very much, Christina, and to Ben, and to everyone that's joining. Um, good evening from Bangkok um, in Thailand. Um, uh, and look, I'm going to kick off by some um, uh, unformed and potentially ill-tempered uh, remarks on a very important topic um, uh, that I've been thinking about quite a lot, and lots of people have been thinking about in post-coup Myanmar. Uh, Burma, and that is looking at the uh, humanitarian dilemmas uh, that I think the country is facing and for lots of international donors, the international community are facing um, moving forward. I was going to start with um, a, a PowerPoint and to kind of go through all of the, the details that um, lots of different international agencies, the UN, um, are going through, but I really want to try and, and um, and provoke some conversation and um, about the the humanitarian human rights um, and ethical dilemmas um, moving forward um, with the crisis in Myanmar. But just to start, if if you look at the recent um, UN OCHA humanitarian snapshot uh, in Myanmar, things really are quite dire, and they were pretty serious before the coup on on February the first. Um, according to UN OCHA, there's one million people. Um, in uh, humanitarian needs around the country. Um, and that's all throughout the country now. It's not just in Rakhine, it's not just in Kachin and, and the Southeast. Um, there are humanitarian crises uh, rising almost every day. Um, and in, in many parts of the country that, that um, people did not perceive as being humanitarian um, crises, but more development issues to, to be addressed. Um, and just to kind of seize uh, attention on that, uh, the UN is is projecting that there's uh, the, the requirements uh, for meeting these these humanitarian needs is 276 million, of which only 39 million have actually been met. That's about 14%. Um, so that that is a starting point. Um, you know, we'll we'll sedge way into uh, what I wanted to talk about today. Um, you know, I really tried to think of, of this discussion um, because I believe that, that and, and having worked on Myanmar for, for many, many years, before 2010 when things started to open up, um, uh, the humanitarian needs were really heavily politicized. And I've always believed that there was a disjuncture um, between international activism and political pressure on Myanmar and the real humanitarian situation on the ground. And a lot of political debates got caught up in humanitarian debates and became heavily politicized um, in, in, in previous periods. And I think we're entering a new and more uh, dynamic environment in which humanitarian issues will become increasingly politicized uh, moving forward. Um, you know, one thing I wanna start by, by saying is that of all the the statements and the commentary and the punditry of the past four months. Um, one thing that, that I really can't stand is a lot of people saying that, that now is the time to act on Myanmar and then never going beyond that. Um, it's a real bugbear of mine, people who say now is the time to act, but they never actually prescribe what you should be doing. And I think humanitarian, um, uh, exigencies moving forward, a, a, a kind of hostage to that. Do something, but do it the way that we want, 
with pressure on, on the State Administration Council and, and, and the Tatmadaw. And I think we've lost the last four months on um, various distractions, whether it's uh, the responsibility to protect, which um, you know, I, I think looking back was a mirage. I think it was misleading um, and audacious to a certain extent. Um, well-meaning, um, uh, definitely. Uh, but, but also, you know, I, I think there was too much of an expectation the international community would act. Um, and it really hasn't. Um, and, you know, we can get into that later on. Other things, talking about no-fly zones, talking about um, safe havens, and, uh, you know, now it's the, the emphasis on an arms embargo. All of these things, I think, are international activism that, that isn't necessarily um, attuned to the emerging uh, crisis on the ground um, in, in Burma, Myanmar. And, and I think that the West has been imposing some pretty well thought out sanctions against various entities and, and individuals, uh, all of which is good. And I'd, I'd much rather see more sanctions that are, are attuned to that than these bland statements that, that a lot of the international community are, are, are coming out with, because it's, it's, it's really not working. Now, to start, I, I think it's important to look at what the pre-coup humanitarian situation in the country was like. Well, it was pretty dire. And, and I think anyone who follows uh, Myanmar pretty closely would, would agree with that. Um, uh, an incredibly intense humanitarian crisis in Rakhine State, not just because of the persecution of the Rohingya and the fact that there was 130,000 people uh, internally displaced there uh, for, for nearly the, the last decade, but of course, uh, the crimes against humanity that drove more than 700,000 Rohingya into Bangladesh in, in, in 2017, but also 100,000 people in uh, Kachin and, and Northern Chan State. The 10th anniversary of, of the resumption of, of that war just passed this week, and those 100,000 people are still protracted, displaced communities now facing uh, added burdens of this post-coup uh, post uh, humanitarian crisis. Um, a lot of the challenges that we're facing humanitarian actors in, in, in the country have been well documented, but limitations on access, uh, difficulties of travel authorization, lack of progress on operationalizing uh, what they call durable solutions, which is basically camp closures and, and people returning uh, to uh, their own communities or, um, or new settlements um, from protracted IDP displacement. Um, very poor engagement on the part of, of a lot of international actors, INGOs and the UN, with both the civilian government and the military government uh, for the past 10 years. Um, lots of limitations on working with ethnic armed organizations uh, around the country, and, and we'll get into that in a minute, but uh, you know, the past 10 years might have seemed very hopeful to a lot of people around the world, but there were still multiple wars going on in the country. And these humanitarian emergencies were really quite entrenched. Um, you know, over the past 10 years, um, up until the, uh, the pandemic really hit in March in, in Myanmar, um, the humanitarian and, and, and development uh, sides to international engagement were beset by lack of coordination, um, deficiencies in UN leadership, um, a lot of competitiveness between INGOs for international funding. Um, and, you know, there were some pretty serious moral conundrums over engaging in protracted humanitarian human rights crises, especially in Rakhine. Um, and if anyone wants to, to look back on, on some really good analysis of this, um, I would really recommend looking at, at Liam Mahoney's reports um, from Fuelview Solutions. Um, uh, over the past few years. And it's, to me, in, in the past four months, I've been thinking back to the situation over the past 10 years and, and trying to find kind of uh, signposts of, of how we should be acting, you know, moving forward. And, and certainly looking at, at some of Liam's reporting um, is, is going to be really quite um, important and, um, and enlightening. Now, what are the post-coup humanitarian challenges? Well, all of that and more that I just quickly sketched through, um, you know, Myanmar is now faced with multiple humanitarian emergencies, armed conflict on so many different fronts that it's bewildering to even try and, and, um, and, and understand them. Um, and, and I think moving forward from speaking to lots of colleagues in, in humanitarian agencies, 
there's a lot of discussion about looking at the current emergencies and the current challenges, but also looking back at pre-2010 uh, modalities of, of operating in, in, in lots of different areas. Um, you know, things were not very easy prior to 2010. There were very few humanitarian agencies that were in the country. A lot of them came in after 2008, after Cyclone Nargis, um, and were well positioned to take advantage of the opening after 2010. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's important to look at lots of uh, pre-2010 modalities of, of supporting people in conflict areas. And that includes looking at uh, cross-border modalities, um, uh, aid coming in from neighboring countries, from, from Thailand to a certain extent, China, India, not so much, Bangladesh, uh, forget about that. Um, and I would point you to um, some incredibly good work by a colleague of mine, Anne Dekaber, uh, who's an academic at the University of Melbourne, who wrote a great book called The Politics of Aid to Burma. And I've been rereading that and actually um, speaking to Anne uh, a bit about some of the, um, not just operational challenges, but the ethical dilemmas of operating in a repressive state in which a military government actually attacks humanitarian workers and attacks uh, uh, health workers and civilians in, in these conflict areas. And we've seen that in the past couple of months, most in, in, intensely um, in the Southeast, but also in Kachin State, increasingly in the West, in, in Chin State and Sagaing. Um, and, and these to me are, are really the challenges moving forward. How do you deal with an ongoing armed conflict uh, and actually get aid to people, realizing that, that you're working partly through a repressive uh, military dictatorship. Um, the kind of dynamic humanitarian needs um, that, that uh, all of the, the actors inside the country, not just INGOs, but domestic um, humanitarian agencies and civil society, local responders as, as they call them, um, are going to have to contend with uh, you know, crises that, that really they couldn't have conceived of um, even just several months ago. Um, in places like Mindat and Chin State, you know, more than 10,000 people uh, displaced from fighting in, in that area. Um, tens of thousands of people displaced uh, by conflict in Langthayar and in the peri-urban areas of, of Yangon. Um, urban displacement, um, urban humanitarian needs are, are all something that the colleagues of mine working on uh, the humanitarian challenges um, are, are all looking at. And then looking at, uh, you know, new conflict fronts or new old conflict fronts in, in places like KR, um, you know, just consider for a minute that in the past few weeks, more than 100,000 people have been displaced by armed conflict in KR State, one of the smallest states in the entire country. Um, 100,000 people, um, people who have been subjected to heavy artillery strikes, air strikes uh, by the Tatmadaw, and the ability to get food aid, medical assistance, um, cash assistance, um, non-food items, all of these things, um, is really something that's stretching domestic humanitarian capacity to, um, to breaking point. And already we're starting to see this military government targeting uh, humanitarian workers even more than they were doing uh, before the coup. Um, and I, I think th the challenges for humanitarian negotiation moving forward is, is going to be incredibly yeah. difficult, dealing with um, uh, an incredibly troglodyte caveman dictatorship like the SAC. Um, in, in which they don't care as much about humanitarianism as they care about human rights. Um, and, and so there really is this huge desperate challenge um, on the part of many different actors um, having to respond to this. Um, one of the things that, that I found quite perplexing before the coup and now after the coup is something that the international development humanitarian complex likes to call the nexus. And that is fusing, you know, very roughly, and I'm sure there's lots of people on the call that, that know far more about this than me, um, fusing development with humanitarianism with peace. And something that, that many people in the UN and, and, and other agencies 
uh, liked to believe that, that Myanmar was this crucial case where, where this could work. Well, from conversations and um, observations that, that I had before the coup um, and before the pandemic, this nexus simply wasn't working. Um, there was this built up expectation that humanitarianism was this, you know, old school, you know, you deal with Rakhine and parts of the north and parts of the southeast, these lingering uh, humanitarian uh, things. And the development actors are coming in with hundreds of millions of dollars and they're going to develop all of Myanmar and work with the government, work with the NLD, even work with the military, who many people thought were a rational partner. In, in lots of this, um, which was delusional in retrospect. Um, now, you look at that nexus, it is completely broken. Uh, a lot of the donors um, internationally have um, stopped all of the development funding. A lot of the development actors have left the country. Um, a lot of the loans that were going to come in, a lot of the big projects, you know, bridges, roads, infrastructure, all of this stuff um, is on hold for the foreseeable future. Um, and humanitarianism really is the, the only kind of core group left standing. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the peace part of that nexus because I think it is quite germane to any conversation about Myanmar moving forward. The, the peace process in Myanmar was dead before the pandemic, it was dead before the coup, and any attempt to reprise it, I think, is folly. Um, it really won't work. Um, the UN did not have any formal part in the peace process. It was, it was an observer. And I think a lot of the Western donors to the peace process saw it as this siloed um, entity uh, in which they could absolve themselves from manifold failings in Rakhine State. Um, and that, uh, that, that only if they pump more money into peace processes, that would be something that would allow large-scale development to come in and assist the country. Um, I think that, that all of these arguments are now completely dead in the water. And humanitarianism really is the only thing um, that is left on, on the part of international engagement where you can actually help practically, um, not just imposing sanctions and releasing statements and, and, and other things. And, and I think the urgent needs in the country um, really um, compels uh, Western donors particularly, to prioritise humanitarian assistance moving forward. Um, now, to end on, on some possible pathways forward, and, and, um, and if I sound provocative, it's, it's intentional, um, because I, I, I really think a lot of these issues um, should be debated, should be debated um, uh, in, in all halls of power. I think anyone designing you know, international pressure and sanctions on Myanmar should be looking at humanitarianism, not as something to politicize um, or, or to instrumentalize in any way, but to actually support um, in, in, in many ways as, as different from a lot of the, the international pressure. I think that the international community, the West, who, who really are the main donors to the humanitarian sector in Myanmar, have to stay committed to life-saving humanitarian operations. Um, and the principles of staying engaged in Myanmar. Um, I do not think that humanitarian um, assistance should in any way be captured by any kind of isolationist tendencies. Um, in other words, donors need to stay committed. Um, and I think moving forward, we need to understand that, that there are many different ways to approach all of these rising crises all around the country. Um, one intervention in one part of the country is not gonna look uh, the way that it will in another part of the country. Um, if you look at Rakhine, strangely enough, after two and a half years of, of pretty hardcore armed conflict in which more than 200,000 people, um, most of them not Rohingya, but, but ethnic Rakhine and, and, and other ethnic cities and, and, and communities, um, were displaced by that conflict. Things have been strangely calm, quiet over the past several months as the Arakan army is, is negotiating with uh, the Myanmar military, the Tatmadaw. Uh, for its own administration and, and semi-autonomy, but still there's great humanitarian needs in Rakhine, um, including the 130,000 Rohingya who are in these camps that have been there for nearly 10 years. Now. Um, and then you've got Kachin, um, protracted displacement again, a new displacement because of the fighting over the past um, four months. And then Northern Shan State in which you have um, incredibly dynamic, multi-sided conflict 
uh, between multiple armed actors and lots of people being displaced multiple times during the year. And don't let the figures fool you. If you, if you see 8,000 people displaced in Northern Chan State and, and think that that's uh, a pittance compared to um, anywhere else, it's, it's not. Um, if, if you really look at the figures, these are people that have been displaced multiple times, talking about 40,000 people perhaps in, in, in one year. Um, and it's really local humanitarian groups that have been responding to that. Um, I think that moving forward, a lot of Western donors need to be adaptive. They need to be flexible towards these emerging challenges. Um, be very open to looking at new challenges, whether it's in Chin State, um, as I mentioned before, in, in, in KR and in, in the Southeast. These are all places that a lot of Western donors didn't really think would actually flare up. But uh, there is no certainty in a post-coup Myanmar. And so I think flexibility and, and, and adaptability and changing the slow moving way that, that donors react to humanitarian crises um, really has to, has to change. Um, and I think that, that moving forward, that you know, all of this outside clamor for sanctions and pressure, um, all of which is, is well-intentioned um, and well-meaning, but you, the humanitarian support should not be held hostage to that. And, and I, I think that there needs to be much more effective ways of dealing with the humanitarian crisis that I didn't necessarily see um, in, uh, in, in the period before 2010. Um, and the humanitarian uh, support really was captured by a lot of pressure politics in, in, in Western Western capitals. Again, moving forward, I, I think we have to not just see the humanitarian crisis in isolation from a hum human rights catastrophe. Um, and quite often donors want to separate these things. It's like, no, that's humanitarian. We're just giving life-saving needs. Well, actually it's a repressive military um, and then multiple armed groups involved in this as well. You, you, you can't uh, uncouple this from the human rights dimension. Uh, which is absolutely drastic, dire, and despicable, um, as, as I'm sure anyone that's followed it over the, um, over the past four, four months would agree. Um, I think one of the priorities moving forward has to be in supporting uh, Myanmar civil society and humanitarian, local humanitarian actors throughout the country. Um, that might have been the case you know, before the coup and before the pandemic, and lots of humanitarian actors and donors like to talk about localization and remote management and all of these, these great buzzwords. That has gone from being a theoretical uh, um, aspiration to now being one of great urgency. And if there's anything that gives me a lot of hope um, is a lot of humanitarian actors that I know around the country from, from Myanmar that are way ahead um, in, in actually um, uh, making this a, a reality. Um, and so donors kind of talk about it and a lot of people from Kachin and the Southeast and, you know, Karen and, and, um, and, and parts of Shan have been doing this already. And I think they're the ones that need to be supported. So when we talk about humanitarian support, don't go thinking that this is just loads of money going to the United Nations. It should be about demanding that this actually goes to a lot of humanitarian actors on the ground who are the best ones to actually navigate all of these, these challenges uh, moving forward. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, my, my one takeaway from this, and this is something that'd be great to hear from, from other people on the call, is that, you know, we always talk about uh, the, the repressive authorities as being, you know, the main obstacle to humanitarian action. And in this case, the State Administration Council and the Tapmador are the main obstacle. I think we're all agreed on that. However, I do think a lack of flexibility, a lack of originality, a lack of daring um, and, and a risk avoidance on the part of Western donors is a major problem as well. Um, and you know, my final point uh, really is that, that looking at the United Nations to be the one to save this in, in terms of humanitarian action is misguided. Um, unfortunately, I think the United Nations has failed Myanmar um, on a whole number of levels. And my fear is that, that moving forward, anyone who sees the UN as the vehicle to actually respond to a lot of these humanitarian challenges uh, will be misguided. I think that they have a knee-jerk reaction to move towards a government that they can deal with 
um, and actually abandon a lot of progressive civil society and local humanitarian actors. And so um, that, that's where I want to leave off, like this, this call for understanding humanitarian dilemmas and, um, and a lot of the emergencies and, and realizing that no one has the right answers. Uh, but the nearest thing to a right answer is actually working with local communities and working through them and finding ways to support them. And that's the best way, I think, that we can mitigate uh, the catastrophic effects um, of this coup d'etat. So I'll leave it there and, and looking forward to questions. Hey, thank you. And I'd like to remind everyone that you can submit a question um, anonymously um, if you'd like or with your name in the Q&A or you're welcome to use the chat. Um, thank you very much for that, Dave. That was wonderful. Um, as some questions are coming in, maybe I'll just share one to get us started. Um, you mentioned that the humanitarian lens, lens is the primary framework as opposed to development, but you also talked about this important relationship between human rights and humanitarian assistance. And I know depending on how you who you talk to, human rights and humanitarianism are viewed as complementary, but sometimes viewed as conflicting. Um, and I'm curious in this context, what do you see as the primary areas for collaboration um, as well as the primary points of potential tension? I think that there's gonna be lots of points of contention. Um, I mean, to me, I mean, in, in a very general sense, I think humanitarian actors from my experience are far more attuned to the human rights dimensions of this than development actors. Um, and development actors in Myanmar always hide behind these insanely anodyne buzzwords and terms like conflict sensitivity and do no harm, which is a humanitarian principle actually. But they kind of hide behind that. And like, oh, we've done our due diligence. We've done this report and we're not going to, to, to mess up. Well, they do mess up all the time. Um, the fact that Myanmar was meant to be this flagship um, engagement case for rights up front from the United Nations. It was anything but um, the, the United Nations was not a leader in promoting human rights in Myanmar um, over the past 10 years. And I think there were a lot of Western donors who paid lip service to human rights, but really were kind of like, look, you know, if we pour hundreds of millions of dollars in and people get jobs and, and we improve standards of living and we have a peace process, then the human rights issues will dissipate and humanitarian issues uh, will be reduced and everything's fine. And that just was not the case. And, um, and I think it was evident definitely to a lot of my colleagues working in conflict areas, but even not in conflict areas in Yangon and, and, and other parts of the country, they, they thought this formulation was absurd. Um, and I think that's where international engagement really lost its way in the past 10 years. The issues of human rights, accountability, genuine rule of, nor, rule of law, not the kind of the, the sop to the term that, that Aung San Suu Kyi had for so many years. That was lost. And, and I think um, a lot of donors really were, let's development ourselves out of this, this problem. Um, and I, I think the coup kind of seized a lot of people's attention that they took their eyes off the military. They took their eyes off the fact that there was um, an ongoing human rights crisis overlaying um, a humanitarian crisis uh, throughout the country. And, and now the country has to face this. Um, and, and so I, I, I wouldn't put any faith in any donor, any international actor that privileges development over the promotion of human rights, accountability, and, and emergency humanitarianism. Thanks, Dave. Um, I have so many questions, but I'm trying to meld them with some of them that are that are pouring in from from the audience. Uh, talking about humanitarian aid now is a seems to me is a problem of distribution, and obviously now the SAC no longer has just you know 25 percent of the economy in their three ministries. They they have access to the entire and control over the entire budget. Um, so how does this money that needs to pour in and needs to pour into local communities, um, what bureaucracy should we, can we trust the EAOs? Um, do we go through the NUG? I was speaking with uh, Tun Mien last night on the phone who started uh, Mutual Aid Myanmar uh, is one way to do it. Um, and this, this goes with one of our anonymous questions. Um, especially relevant to you as you're in Thailand, but asking about how do you enhance uh, cross-border assistance through Thailand? 
Um, is it is it more through public pressure or is it through quiet diplomacy? Oh, they're, they're really big questions. Um, I mean, one of the biggest challenges is the fact that the SAC has destroyed the economy, has destroyed the banking sector, um, has destroyed the bureaucracy, has destroyed all, um, almost all means of actually getting money to the people um, who need it. Um, increasingly, they're destroying supply chains, um, the means of production. Um, and, and that's why I'm trying to emphasize humanitarian assistance because I think livelihoods um, throughout the country are going to be already incredibly disrupted um, by this coup. And I think that a lot of donors need to think far more artfully, perhaps skating probably closer to uh, their usual modalities of, of financial assistance than, than they're usually comfortable with. Um, in order to get life-saving assistance to people. Um, and as I was saying, I, I think that's going to look very different in different parts of the country. Some is going to be very, very difficult. Um, some, I think, if you think of cross-border um, assistance, that was being done, in my view, pretty well from the Thai Burma border for many years. And if you're looking at really good partners that really know what they're doing, there's a lot of capacity in the Southeast from Karan Kareni and Mon civil society that really know what they're doing. They're used to this um, because of course, it, it's not as if these conflicts um, in the Southeast went away when all the international donors turn up. Uh, the peace industrial complex would like to beguile you with notions that the Southeast was a post-conflict environment, uh, which was absurd rubbish uh, you know, to anyone who, who actually cared to look at the situation. Um, and, and there are a great many actors um, who can absorb the kind of financial assistance. And, you know, I, I think discretion and, um, and, and making sure that it's going to the right people, it can be done, not without difficulties. I mean, I'm not trying to underplay it, uh, but it can actually be done if, if people do it in, in, in the right way. And what we don't need is donors blundering around trying to stick a label on everything. Um, or advertise what they're doing. Um, they need to prioritize actually getting financial support and food aid and, and, and lots of other things to, to, to people in need. And not just looking at active conflict zones, but actually looking at uh, urban displacement. Um, a lot of colleagues of mine are, are looking um, at the potential for future um, urban displacement. We're already seeing that in, in KR, for example. Um, and so I, I think you know, the capacity, in, in my view, the capacity within Myanmar is there if the financial assistance is actually forthcoming. But that's got to be done in very artful, innovative ways um, that gets around all the logistical challenges of actually getting money there and actually finding and, and sourcing uh, the supplies. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on some of those artful ways without perhaps undermining those who are using those mechanisms, because obviously we don't want to shared trade secrets that can uh, be stopped. Um, but can you elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, not in any detail, because, um, you know, basically um, finding different ways to get money to the right people to basically to, to buy things, to support people. Um, mm -hmm. in, in a broken banking system, um, you know, with disruptions to the internet and, and, and everything else, um, you know, there are a lot of people, basically the past four months, people have been talking artfully in, in ways uh, to do this. Um, you know, a lot of people that I know have been talking about doing it. But I do see that there's this reluctance on the part of, of, um, of donors to go, oh, you know, isn't that kind of semi-legal? It's like, no, it's actually legal. And it's, it's just not the way that you would normally do it. And, and that's kind of the overarching thing that I was trying to say, that, that there's lots of donors going, oh, we really want to help, and how do we help? It's like, well, you've got to do it this way. Ooh, that's, that doesn't look good on a log frame. That's not going to look good back in capital. And it's like, well, you, there's a disassociation from what your political masters are saying that you should help people and from what you're willing to do. When there is actually, I think, this capacity on the ground to actually absorb it. Um, and I would much rather talk to um, a colleague working in, in conflict zones that actually knows what they're doing than I would a bean counter at an embassy. 
um, who's like, no, that, that doesn't really balance the books. In, in a crisis, really, um, you know, get moving um, and, and realize that what you're doing is actually laying the foundation for future support. This is not like a one-off uh, moving things in. This is the ability to actually start helping people long term. And there's already a lot of people that I know from different uh, humanitarian communities, shall we say, I really don't want to name names, who, who are really trying to say, look, we have to figure out the kind of assistance that we're formulating now that is not just a food dump or you know, a, a one-off, but is actually something that builds into the future, that this will be a protracted conflict. Um, and in, in other words, you know, trying to figure out mechanisms in which you can sustain that assistance. Um, sorry, I know that's, that's really quite vague, but um, no, that's, that's the conversation uh, that, that a lot of people are having. So humanitarianism um, can cover all manner of sins. We could be talking about aid, we could be talking about fighting. Um, if I'm hearing you right, you're, you're, you're kind of advocating for guerrilla humanitarian distribution of, of aid. So uh, breaking the old structures and doing it as needed. Um, that sort of turns me into, again, a question from a, from a young teenager here um, asking what role they have um, as a teenager in improving humanitarianism. And I might be reading too much into it, but it, it seems to me it might be a, a way of asking about um, the use of, of violence um, which we've seen growing. We've seen lots of reports of, of attacks against the Tatmadaw, against the police, uh, killing of informants. Um, is there room for that strategy? Um, is that the only way that we can maybe buy time? Um, I think economic collapse and economic catastrophe is, is, is a given at this point. We're just trying to narrow the window of how long that's going to last. Um, how, how do we broaden that window? Is, that, is there room for that? It's a, it's a hard thing to even talk about coming from a human rights standpoint, but if, if we have no staging areas, we have no hope of intervention, um, must it remain peaceful? Should it remain peaceful? Um, I don't think that that's my place to say. Um, I, I really think that the right of people for self-defense um, is, is, you know, I, I respect that. If, if, if that's the path that, that you choose, um, then, then so be it. I mean, my approach for many years being a human rights worker is that, um, you know, being criticised for not taking a side, um, something I've been charged with before, but I've always taken a side, and that's the side of the victim. Um, and it's a pretty good side to be on. Um, in, in, in my view. Um, and there is a way that you can say, look, if you want to resist, that's completely up to you. I make no judgment on that. And this is where international humanitarian law and human rights law comes in. It's, it's not your decision to do that. It's the conduct um, uh, of, of the armed hostilities that quite rightly people like, you know, uh, you and me and Christina and, and international reserves have, have the right to actually judge the, the conduct of armed conflict, but not the, the decision to actually engage in. Um, my view on looking at humanitarianism is if you actually support a free, democratic, accountable Myanmar, then there are many different people in that country who are trying to resist this um, seizure of power uh, by the SAC. Um, some of it peaceful, some of it very innovative, some of it through humanitarianism, some of it through uh, local support, education, health, uh, not just violent insurrection. Um, and to me, the immediacy is that, that people actually can sustain life um, and, and to help people in need through this. And what they do with that afterwards is, is their decision, in, in my view. Um, in, in other words, you've got to keep people healthy so that they can make the choice how they resist um, an illegal regime. Um, and, you know, I think it's a dilemma. It's, you know, it's one of these cycles of international donor hand-wringing. They love the early stages of, of a crisis where it's like, oh, peaceful demonstrations. Isn't that 
that fantastic. The moment it turns even a little bit violent, it's like, no, we can't stand that. We can't support anything like that. Um, and they're finding ways to move towards the sack, in my view. A lot of donors are coming up with incredibly idiotic terms like exit ramps and, and, uh, and you know, ways to get out of this. It's like, no, this is, you're, you're insane. You basically, you, you see people resisting in, in a very violent manner and you're assuming that everyone else that's resisting the coup is like that. That's absurd reductionist thinking um, and, and should be rejected. Your role as a humanitarian donor is to actually support life-saving assistance, of which there are huge needs in the country, many of which are not involved in, in armed resistance, um, but, but might very well be involved in, in, in a peaceful repudiation of the coup d'etat. Um, and so I think you know, we're going to have to grapple with all of these uh, moral conundrums moving forward. Um, and I don't think that you know, the, the idea that some of this assistance might be siphoned off to, um, to armed actors should um, inhibit any international donors. Um, you know, being artful in the way that you're trying to get assistance to people, as long as you don't have the CIA or MI6 actually channeling weapons um, to, to parts of the resistance, then, you know, get over yourselves. Um, you know, which is, you know, I'm sure a lot of people on this call are probably just as frustrated as me. This whole Syria analogy is utterly idiotic. Um, you know, Myanmar is not Syria. Myanmar is Myanmar. Okay, and so no one's thinking of arming one side. This is not, um, you know, I say this out of all sympathy to, to people in Syria. You know, international powers really messed up that conflict. And I don't think there's any real fear so far that that's gonna happen to Myanmar. So get over yourselves and get rid of the Syria analogy and actually find ways to help millions of people who need life-saving assistance. Um, and, and emphasize that, that's where you can actually do something good instead of these banal statements that the capital is constantly put out. Thank you. We have an, another question from the audience um, that I'll read, quote, you suggested localization agenda seems to be the best option at this point, but do you think that it would put local organizations in a very risky position given the current level of suppression? We've already heard news about arbitrary arrest of local humanitarian actors. What do you think the donors can do to strike a balance between moving things forward through localization and making sure the safety and security of the local organizations while mm -hmm. avoiding to shy away from helping the communities that are now most in need? That's a very good question. Um, a lot of those local actors are definitely a risk. Um, you know, we're already seeing that. Um, but a lot of them have also been confronting these risks for many years, especially in Kachin and, and parts of, of the Southeast and, and parts of Northern Shan. Um, a lot of local um, humanitarian actors and lots of uh, local employees of, of INGOs, they know far better than foreigners how to actually navigate a lot of this. And, and they find ways uh, to, to get through this. I mean, I think the post-coup environment is, is far more violent um, and unpredictable than, um, than four months ago. But still, you're talking about a lot of people who really um, have the ability to, um, to assess the, the security dilemma, um, to assess the risks and find ways to circumvent it. Um, you know, without in, in any way trying to underestimate the risks. Um, I, I think th there are lots of people who, who, who understand how to actually do this. Um, and, and that's where, again, I, I find the UN and, and, and some of the Western donors quite frustrating. It's, it's like, look, you, know, they've, you talk about empowerment, which is such a horrible, you know, um, demeaning term. A lot of these people are already empowered. They're, they're helping their own communities. They know what they're doing. If they say that they can do it, then give them the money to do it. Um, whether it's the, the joint strategy team in Kachin, some of the... the um, the NGOs and Lasho, um, definitely a lot of the, the organizations in the Southeast, they, they know what they're doing and they know the risk better than, um, than, than a donor sitting in an embassy. So actually support them when they say that they can do it. Um, and don't ever try to think that you can push them into risk-taking behavior because a lot of these people know exactly what they're doing and they're going to, to rebuff you. 
Um, so without trying to downplay the risks, I, I think there's a lot of capacity. The, the other thing is that, that, you know, localization has been this buzzword that a lot of humanitarian actors and um, coming from the grand bargain, you know, the, the World Humanitarian Summit and all of this, but a lot of the people in Myanmar were far advanced than what foreigners were, were conceiving as localization. Um, so in other words, you know, follow their lead because they're the ones that are gonna actually have to do this and help their own people and their own constituencies. So Dave, you brought up sanctions and, and an appetite to see you know, well, well-crafted ones brought in. So if we can jump a little bit from the micro to the macro, a lot of people are arguing, including Tant Min Yu, um, about engagement with, with Beijing, that sanctions, no matter what we do, if, if Beijing isn't involved in some way, um, that they're going to be meaningless. And the only entity that is set up to weather the crisis that's coming is the Tatmadaw itself. Um, so what, what do you think that engagement should look like? What are the pressure points um, that we might be able to, to do um, or to press, I suppose? Um, is that your belief? Do you agree with, with, with that judgment or do you have uh, another point of view? Um. You know, as much as the, the recent sanctions um, that have been imposed have been maligned by, by some people, you know, will they have the desired effect of actually convincing the State Administration Council and, and, um, and Min Online to relinquish power? No. Um, have they been directed at the right entities and, and the right people? Yes. Um, so, you know, they're, they're symbolic. Um, uh, you know, they probably won't have the desired effect. If the desired effect was, um, you know, handing over power back to the, the NLD um, and the elected parliament. Um, one thing is that I think the West has been completely misguided, some more than others, is this idea that you can impose some sanctions and then get the Association of Southeast Asian Nations to kind of be uh, the vanguard of, of international diplomatic efforts. Um, that's about the most morally, intellectually, common sense, bankrupt, idiotic idea that I've ever heard. Um, and anyone that believes that ASEAN is um, capable of anything more than a round of golf is deluding themselves and anyone that they speak to. Um, so forget ASEAN, continue to in, impose those sanctions. And that's where um, uh, I think Australia should be quite ashamed of itself, this idea that, that it can use ASEAN and use its own contacts with the military to have some kind of breakthrough and not impose sanctions. Utterly absurd. Um, now, the next step will be, you know, can United Nations media mediation efforts work? No, I don't think, you know, for all the well-meaning efforts of the UN Special Envoy, I don't think she's having really any impact that I see. Um, engaging with Beijing, yeah, it's important. Um, will you get what you really want out of it? Probably not. Um, but it's probably a much better expenditure of diplomatic capital than dealing with ASEAN. Um, forget about dealing with India. Um, Japan, South Korea, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty much about it. Um, forget about talking to Russia. They're basically, Myanmar is, is, um, is a destination for weapon systems, and, and that's about it. Um, and, and so, you know, China really is it. The biggest question is, is are the Western powers, is the UK, the US, Canada, the EU, Australia really going to expend that much diplomatic capital to get China um, to change course? Probably not. But then again, it's kind of like the arms embargo. It won't work for so many different reasons, but it's worth doing as a process of reminding people um, of who's really behind all of this. Um, and anything that unsettles uh, the SAC and Minong Lai is worth pursuing, in my view. Um, you know, if, if in that insane little mind of his, he's sitting in naked or and he sees that the West is engaging Beijing, um, even if it doesn't work, um, hopefully it gives him a sleepless night. Um, much better than dealing with ASEAN. Thanks. Um, I'm trying to, to read and, and pose my own questions at the same I can, time. So I, I can apologize. jump in for a second then, um, if you'd okay. like, while you're catching up. Um, there are a couple questions. These are going to be difficult to answer, um, so I apologize in advance. But there have been a couple questions about not just the response to the violations that have occurred, but how do we stop this 
in the first place? How do we put an end to the mass atrocities going on? And there's a question about RTP going through the UN and then questions a little more generally about how do we, how do we stop this? So appreciating this is a very large and difficult question. Um, what are your thoughts on not just the response but the prevention side? On the prevention of atrocities? Yes. Um, you know, to be honest, I, I found uh, the, it, there was a hint of desperation, I thought, on the part of all of those protesters who, who came out peacefully in, in February and, and, and in March, calling for international assistance and calling for RTP. Um, and, and I, I wondered where that came from. And, and I think there was this built up thing from, um, from the aftermath of the horrors of Rakhine in 2017, that, that a lot of uh, the of, of government in, in Napidor thought that R2P was kind of uh, this precursor to a Western military intervention. And so R2P became this discussion in Myanmar. And I, I'm not too sure if, if and, and to me it was like, I thought R2P was something that we talked about 20 years ago in an international relations class. Um, you know, that really, it, it just, what I mean, very fine ideals. I'm not wanting to discredit um, the principles behind it. Um, but as an effective instrument for statecraft, you know, it's, it's just, it's not even a blunt tool. It's not even a tool. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a talking item. Um, and so I think that there was a lot of misguided expectations um, put in there. But I would wrap that up actually in a lot of disappointment in the United Nations, especially, um, and in the West uh, gradually. I mean, lots of uh, colleagues and friends of mine, um, you know, the very angry reactions towards the United Nations um, that, that definitely started coming out in April and you started seeing that. and. Um, you know, the UN no action. And, and I, I think people are quite right to have that, that dismissal of, of the UN system and, and, and those kinds of, of, of international engagement. Um, you know, that, I, I think that there was a slow dawning realization that the West has basically been setting up a betrayal of, of the entire movement. Um, and, and so I think all considerations to what the West can actually do should be you know, severely curtailed. You know, the, the West is really not coming to help. Some sanctions, maybe they'll think of some, some diplomatic pressure. Um, you know, I, and, and that's why I think that the one concrete thing that the UN and the West can do is supporting ongoing humanitarian assistance. You know, I, 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 their statements, I, I think the UN Secretary General is out to lunch. He's just looking for re-election. Um, you know, the whole good officers uh, mandate is, is misguided now, it's out of date. The UN Security Council will never really do anything uh, uh, that, that's meaningful. You know, all respect to, um, to the UN Special Rapporteur, I think he's doing a very good job. But again, there are limitations to this. There are limitations to the HRC. Um, and, and in, in some ways, and it's not their fault, they've been giving um, uh, false hope, I think, to a lot of people um, in the country. Um, and, and that needs to stop. I think there needs to be messages of like, this is what we can actually do to, to help and, and to make it more, more concrete. Um, I did just see um, a message from uh, Thortet. Um, what is the best way to break down the INGO bureaucracy that seriously hinders good interventions? Rules around finance, accounting, and audits hinder funding for months. Thotet, you are 100% right on the mark there. Um, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time criticizing the UN and donors, but a lot of NGOs and their bureaucracies are the enemy to good interventions as well. Um, and, and I think that a lot of INGOs were like deer stuck in the headlights after the coup. They really were like, what? We really didn't expect this to happen. How do I renew my MOU with Naked Oil? Where's my line ministry? It's like, did, did the coup and the arrest of, of you know, the democratically elected leaders of the country not 
register with you. And even four months down the track, hundreds of people killed, murdered, 4,000 people in prison, um, uprisings around the country, massive repression. And I think some INGO agencies are still like, well, we can kind of work in, in, in these areas um, if only we have the right partner. These are not the people that, that I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, INGOs that actually do work in emergency settings um, and can actually balance life-saving assistance, actually working with people, sustaining life with, um, with promoting human rights and actually doing the right thing. I know that sounds you know, outrageously um, utopian, um, but I, I think that there's some agencies who, who are actually willing to do that. A lot of them, especially who have been there for, for quite some years and have seen what happened in Rakhine, have seen what happened in Kachin and, and other places, and have been complicit in, um, in this betrayal of humanitarian principles. Um, I think that there are quite a few people who are willing to stay and actually ride this out. But as, as you were saying, um, you know, they need to change their, their modes of operation. They need to change their finances. Their, I mean, whenever Western donors talk about accountability, they're talking about a relatively small amount of money that they want to see every I dotted and, and T crossed when there's no accountability for what they're doing. Their accountability is to actually start helping people and they should be a lot more flexible in, in, in their modalities. That's the only way you respond to a crisis like this. Um, if you're not as a donor, then pack up and go home because you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. Hey Dave, I'm gonna ask you to, to, to be like a brand manager of, of, of some sort here. How would you go about making the argument that, that Burma, that Myanmar is strategically important and, and what it means if we fail in, in our job? Because clearly people dying, people being tortured is, is not enough. That's happening in lots of places. Um, is there, a, is there a, an avenue to, to gain international investment and intention, uh, attention by talking about the rise of, it's going to be an illicit economy if we don't do something, the rise of methamphetamines, um, the degradation of the natural resources, the forest, the biodiversity. How, how would you, if you were trying to sell this to um, whether it's the UN or other interested governments um, to, to make them interested, make the case of why it's, why it's so important? That's, that's a really good question, but it's also a double-edged sword question um, because a lot of these problems of rampant methamphetamine production um, existed before the coup. A lot of the, um, the arrangements, uh, the, um, uh, the opportunities for a lot of illicit economies existed for years and years. Um, and, and in some cases, that argument is slamming the gate shut after the horse has bolted. Like it's, it's already there. And there's been some good analysis on saying, well, those conditions were there, but the coup actually makes it more chaotic, which provides a vacuum for illicit economies um, to thrive. And already we're starting to see some of the methamphetamine production from Northern Shan shift to Southern and Eastern Shan into Laos, into Cambodia, um, in, into the region. But, um, you know, for transnational criminal networks, you know, Myanmar must be like, okay, functional chaos. This is what we like. A dependable partner, which is the SAC, it's the Tatmadaw. They've always been that dependable partner. Um, so that's one side of the sword. The other side of the sword is if you, if you do propound that argument, um, you're going to come face to face with foreign policy, uh, policy makers, thinkers who are like, well, um, we can't have Australia being awash in crystal meth. We can't have Japan and Taiwan and, and all of Southeast Asia being awash in all of these, um, uh, in, in, in all of these products. Therefore, we have to work with an authority that can interdict all of this. Well, that's the Myanmar police force. That's the partner that um, a lot of Western governments have worked with for years. And, you know, if you look at the, the launch of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime Synthetic Drugs Report yesterday, um, and they talked a lot about this, what was not said is that their natural partner is the Myanmar police force. That's been their partner for years. Um, the same police force that has been gunning down people around the country 
uh, for the past four months is their natural partner. And so I, I think, you know, pushing forward that argument that you've got this failed state and all of these ills are going to spill over the border into the region. One, it's already happening. Two, the facilitator to, you know, if, if they're the surge of, of all of these illicit economies actually eventuates, is going to be the tap metal. Um, and yet the West is looking at this and going, well, we need to work with them to actually stem this because we don't want to admit that they're actually, they're the ones who caused it. And, you know, in, in a longer historical view of this, that's been the case for the past 50 years. You can say this about the heroin boom in the 70s and the 80s, um, when lots of uh, Burmese heroin uh, went to um, North America. Um, you can say it about the Yaba boom uh, in, in the 90s, uh, which, which flooded Thailand uh, with uh, cheap meth. You can say that about the crystal meth boom over the past several years. The Myanmar military has been the overseer of this entire complex. And, and so, you know, coming out with this argument that the coup has created this chaotic uh, laboratory for illicit items. Well, you know, you, you're led down into um, cooperating with the, the janitor of, of all of this. When what you'd be doing is going, if we really want to stop this, it's about getting rid of the sack and getting the military under civilian control and actually stopping all this. Um, and that is something that people in Canberra and Washington and, and London kind of go, oh, I just, whatever. And, you know, I want to be very blunt here. A lot of Western capitals just want this to go away and just resume some kind of vexed, uh, problematic, distasteful relationship with whoever is in power in Napier um, and not realize that it's actually against their interests. And that's just how you know, modern foreign policy establishments think against their own interests. And definitely against the interests of the people of Myanmar. That to me is the biggest crime. Um, all right, well, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pause because I have something to say about that, but I, I'd like also to, to see what this next question is. I'm just gonna read it verbatim. Uh, as we all know, the recent so-called political issues in Myanmar have led to multiple forms of conflicts throughout the country. That has unfortunately resulted in a serious humanitarian situation. Do you think one way to resolve that issue would be a humanitarian ceasefire? And this is something that the international actor should aim for. And how do you think the multiple parties to the conflict at this point would be amenable to a thing like that? So a question about a possible ceasefire and whether that would be beneficial. Um, I guess the problem with that, I think that's a, it's, it's a very good idea and it's, it's quite laudable. Um, but the Tapmador has a ceasefire. Um, you know, they've been having ceasefires for the past, uh, nearly three years. You know, you, you announce a unilateral ceasefire and you just keep fighting. Um, that's been their modus operandi. Um, and it really hasn't benefited a lot of people around the country. A humanitarian ceasefire. I mean, nationwide, I really don't think that's going to work. There are way too many actors uh, to be involved. Um, localized humanitarian ceasefires, very good in principle, and I definitely agree with that. Um, but the problem now is that there are so many multiple actors in so many different places, trying to get them all to agree. Figuring out who they are for a start is, is, is going to be quite problematic. Um, and the problem with humanitarian ceasefires, it, certain points is that it benefits one side or, or, or the other. Um, it might have been quite heartening to see the president of um, the ICRC uh, meeting Min online last week. And, um, and I don't want to make any comment on the ICRC. It's, it's, it's their view. If they have any role in actually facilitating humanitarian ceasefires and getting aid to, to people trapped, then um, th that can only be a good thing. Um, but, but again, that's something that, that they do. Um, I'd like to think that that would work, but it could only really work in very localized uh, cases right now. I can't see a nationwide humanitarian ceasefire having any effect because you're dealing with an incredibly sincere partner in that ceasefire, which is the Tapmadal. Thank you. We have one last question from the audience, and then I believe Ben has another one before we wrap up. Um, this question is, how does the CDM um, and support for its participants feed into humanitarian assistance that is needed 
particularly given that this support is needed not just in ethnic states, but in urban areas of the Bamar heartland. Would such support reinforce the Tatmadaw's inclination to block assistance, regardless of whether or not it's directed at the CDM? It seems that we've seen an uptick in these blockages in recent weeks um, as a version of the Tatmadaw's four cuts. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a dilemma. You've got all of these needs in urban areas um, that are the aftershocks of the coup. Um, there, there may not be violence in, in, in certain areas, but there are disruptions to food supply and, and you know, a lot of um, working poor who are out of jobs either because of the COVID-19 pandemic or because of the coup and, and the disruptions there, um, who are, are going to be in need of, of life-saving assistance. The World Food Programme's already um, uh, been working on that. You know, again, the biggest challenge is going to be the disruptions that the security forces put in place of, of, um, uh, of, of implementing that. For the CDM, that's completely up to them. I would, uh, I would make a call that, that for life-saving assistance is actually feeding very, very vulnerable people and assisting them. Um, th there shouldn't be any blockade of of, of things like that. There, there are lots of different ways that, that you can interdict the, the operations of the government, security forces, um, but, but I do think that, that urgent life-saving humanitarian assistance should not be a target um, by all sides. Um, and again, not you know, um, uh, instrumentalize um, in any of it either. That's very easy for me to say, um, it's far more difficult to actually see it work on the ground. And that's going to be the challenges um, moving forward. And, and as I was saying earlier, it's going to change from place to place. Um, there's going to be lots of intensive negotiations um, in, in how this plays out. But, um, but yeah, how, how the CDM actually reacts to this is, is going to be really interesting to see if, if they're going to continue um, this struggle and all indications are that they will. I hope they will um, for as long as they can. Uh, I think just final question, I, I feel like I might know where you, what you might say in some respects, but there's a lot of talk about, you know, the People's Defense Force, and there's a lot of hopeful talk about uniting the EAOs um, and sort of some sort of federal army of, of the future. Um, given the mistrust, given the, the, the different strategies and, and needs of, of these what, what is your hope with that? Is there, is there any hope which, which ones are likely to support sort of a more federalist system? Which, which do you think might be more likely to just try to carve out their own, their own more territory um, and strengthen their, their position? Um, is there any hope among these groups of, 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 co of a coalition that, that, that can at least stall some of the, the actions of the government, not the government, the top of the, the sack? I mean, I, I would certainly like to hope so, but I, I think that, you know, there, there are all these expectations that, um, that something like the National Unity Government um, is, is going to be, you know, the, um, you know the, the one ring to rule them all kind of idea. And I just don't think that's realistic. I, I think that they're, they're weak. I think there's uh, a question of legitimacy. I don't want to dismiss them because I think some of them are really trying quite hard. Um, it's pretty hard to actually form a parallel government in exile and, um, and, and, and be that embattled and, and to be asking for assistance from um, ethnic armed organizations and ethnic communities that you're, you know, if you were from the National League for, De for Democracy, uh, that you had ignored for the last 10 years, um, you know, um, to come hat in hand and, and, and ask for assistance. Um, I think that a lot of these groups should resist the compulsion to control everything um, and, and, you know, issue the whole term unity. I mean, unity in Myanmar is so problematic. Um, and, you know, I, I want to evoke here, I think one of the great um, uh, thinkers of modern Myanmar, Chao Seng Yongwe, um, who, who passed away, um, uh, um, nearly 20 years ago, he talked about um, common vision, uh, different uh, approaches. That, you know, we don't all have to kind of work together on a highly structured uh, machine. We can all work to the same purpose of a federal democratic union. 
but we just do it in different ways. As long as we're talking to each other, um, that's fine. Um, I, I have to resist the idea that people want this neat kind of package of a resistance complex so they can figure out who that they can talk to. By definition, it's going to be incredibly complicated, messy, um, and dysfunctional uh, because that's just the reality of, of the situation. Um, and I think that um, all of these disparate forces, whether it's you know PDFs and Sagaing and EAOs and Shan State and um, and in the southeast and, and people in the cities who are resisting um, the coup, if they're all like, look, we're doing our thing, and we all agree on getting rid of the Tatmadaw and overturning the coup, that's good enough for us. We don't have to join. You know, but we're all kind of aware of, and it's you know. That said, it's going to be incredibly messy and, and unfortunately, incredibly violent. Um, but that's just the reality that the SAC has made. Um, and so, and I do think that there are potentially some pretty good conversations to come out of all of this about what a federal democratic union um, is, is going to look like. And there's going to be a kaleidoscope of, of views, I think. Um, and even with the embattled reality of a lot of these groups, at least they're having that conversation which the NLD wasn't having. And, you know, maybe that's, that's a, a very positive um, thing moving forward. And, and embrace the fact that there's not one narrative that you have to just unite under one charismatic leader. The way that Myanmar was set up for 20 years under, um, you know, when Aung San Suu Kyi was, was under house arrest. Um, I think one positive thing is that, that the country's moving beyond that. Um, and people have been politically socialized, unfortunately, in some cases, radicalized um, by some of this, but um, look at it potentially as an awakening um, and, and as something to build on. So th there is a very positive side, I think, to look at this as much as a, you know, the doom and gloom of conflagration, failed state and, and, and all of these other things, which are, are real, I'm not dismissing that. Um, but there is a potentially brighter side, the fact that there's lots of people talking about a vision for Myanmar. And, you know, you mentioned Thant. He just had a piece in Foreign Affairs in which he, he said, you know, very similar thing. This is a time to think of a new Myanmar and, and, and to think of those possibilities. And there are a lot of people, you know, Myanmar friends of mine who are incredibly cynical and traumatised by what's gone on the past four months, but they're still thinking through a lot of these things. And I think our role as outsiders, as foreigners, is to find every way to support them without getting in the way of, of what they're doing. Our role really should be any kind of material support, financial or, um, or logistical that we can have to actually support this revolution um, and, and not get involved in any of these debates. Just try and understand it from their perspective, um, if that makes any sense, Ben. I think that's a perfect way to wrap up, actually. Um, before we do, are there any concluding thoughts that you want to end with? Uh, no, I think I've been quite verbose and and, um, and opinionated um, enough already. Um, and thank you, everyone, for you know, being subjected to that. Um, I, I do want to end on on a positive note, um, which is all of the the horrors that we're seeing, um, and undoubted horrors, um, and things will continue to get bad. But um, I think anyone who's worked on Myanmar um, as a foreigner um, for the past 20 years or more and, and have, have many friends um, there and have seen really good things happen in, in the past 10 years, lots of bad things happen as well, um, can see this very dark uh, period as, um, as incredibly depressing. But also I, I, I think the future of the country is the people from Myanmar. It's not from the outside. It won't be pressure from the outside. It won't be sanctions. It, it, it won't be donors. It'll be the people of Myanmar. And, and that to me is, is, is quite inspiring. And I think for anyone who wants to support um, uh, the resistance, um, the, uh, the revolution, we have to find very small, modest ways to help people achieve that. Um, and that's being friends, it's, it's, it's providing financial assistance in, in any way that we can, um, but never give up because I don't think all of those people in Myanmar are giving up. So, um, th that would be my final concluding thought for all of these uh, hand-wringing foreigners um, who see this as a failed state, and something to walk away from and, and, and is something of great disappointment. 
don't think that. I mean, this, this is something that you, you've got to be there in this hour of need um, and be in it for the long run because this will take um, quite a long time. Um, and there are a lot of committed people and don't betray them by walking away. Okay, well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, if you'd like to learn more about upcoming webinars, please visit our website, which is in the chat. And we also um, really welcome recommendations of topics that you'd like to see us address through this series. And you can email us at ishr at columbia.edu. We are also collaborating with T-Circle to um, put this up. We'll have a YouTube link, but also to transcribe or do a write-up of this that will also be translated. Um, and so we'll be sending that out and making that available on our website as well. So thank you again very much. And we look forward to seeing you the next time. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Ben. Really appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you. everyone else.